I would say this, and this is the single most important thing that I have found in leadership that has led me to success. And that is when you give the credit out to other people and you lift them up rather than wanting yourself to be looked at, the light naturally shines back on you mm. and your organization becomes successful. Well, greetings, everybody, and welcome to Buzz for Good, where we talk all things nonprofit, the people they serve, and the good they do. I am Michael Hempel, creator and host of this radio show and the TV show Buzz. And in preparing for today's show, I wanted to do something that highlights Women's History Month, which takes place in March. Last time on the show, I talked with leaders of the Roanoke Women's Foundation and 100 plus women who care New River Valley about why women give. And you can listen to my conversations with them at buzzforgood.com slash podcast. That's buzz, B-U-Z-Z, number four, good.com slash podcast. For today, I wanted to continue some version of that conversation. So when I looked back at the 30 episodes of our TV show, Buzz, that airs on Blue Ridge PBS and on YouTube, I discovered that nearly all of them featured nonprofit organizations that are led by women, which got me wondering why. So on today's show, it's my honor to talk with five of those women who lead nonprofits in Southwest Virginia, from Healing Strides of Virginia, Literacy Volunteers of the New River Valley, Ram House Homeless Shelter, Brain Injury Services of Southwest Virginia, and Angels of Assisi. They share with me what led them to lead nonprofits and why women, whether it's through nature or nurture, may be better suited to do so. Speaking of women who lead, I want to invite you to our next free community watch party on March the 29th at the Grandin Theater that celebrates our newest episode of Buzz starring The Least of These Ministry which helps the homeless in Roanoke. It's an incredible organization founded and led by Dawn Sandoval. And we were thrilled to connect Dawn with Wheeler Digital, which is donating digital marketing campaigns and a series of videos that will attract more donors and volunteers to support the least of these. Again, this episode airs on Blue Ridge PBS on March the 29th at 7 p.m., And our watch party at the Grandin Theater is free. Doors open at 6.30 p.m. Register at buzzforgood.com under events. Also, stay connected with us throughout the week on our social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and TikTok, all at buzz4good. I want to thank our sponsors, Freedom First Credit Union, where people bank for good at freedomfirst.com as well as Partners in Financial Planning, a Southwest Virginia-based financial management firm, partnersinfinancialplanning.com. Also, the Louise Lester Foundation, which is providing the sponsorship support of our episode featuring the least of these. And now, in celebration of Women's History Month, here are my conversations with five nonprofit leaders who are women. In this order, Carol Young of Healing Strides, Jenny Ayers of Literacy Volunteers of the New River Valley, Jody Judge with Brain Injury Services of Southwest Virginia, Lisa O'Neill with Angels of Assisi, and Melissa Woodson of Roanoke Area Ministries Ram House. From their roles as mothers and the role their own mothers played in their lives and the lives of their communities, to leading with their heart over their ego and a belief in servant leadership. These women share some expected and surprising reasons why women are more inclined to lead nonprofits. All right, well, it is my pleasure to welcome to Buzz for Good, Carol Young, who is the Executive Director of Healing Strides of Virginia, the nonprofit we featured in our very first episode of Buzz way back in 2019, 2020, and Jenny Ayers, Executive Director of the Literacy Volunteers of the New River Valley, 
which we are as our most recent episode of Buzz that will air in April on Blue Ridge PBS. And welcome to you both here on our special uh, episode about women who lead nonprofits. Thank you. I appreciate that. I want to start off with, and Carol, I'll start with you. What was your life journey, your path before you founded Healing Strides? <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> So I uh, am a mom of eight children. Mm -hmm. uh, we are a blended family. I had birthed five and, and then inherited the other three. And I was a homeschooling mom. And I have had horses in my life since I was four years old and always had horses. They, they were always a part of who I am. Um, during that time, I worked as a salesperson for a log home company and was one of the top salespeople in the country selling log homes, designing log homes. So my heart was always helping people. And in 2008, the market world crashed, right? Uh, and so second homes, which log houses typically are, fell apart and I needed something to do. And I found, uh, I did not found healing strides, but they call me a refounder because it was uh, literally going to close when I came in 2008 and they asked me if I would help develop this organization. Um, and I was able to take all of the things that have happened in my life, my love of horses, my want to of helping people and combine those two passionate things and started healing strides over again. Mm -hmm. And it has been just an amazing journey. Yeah, so where does that desire, that need to help people come from in your life? Oh, I am going to say that we are created by God to be servants. And that um, I have from a very, my mom used to say to me, you can't save them all. And I would say, I'm going to save as many as I can, right? <laughs> uh, and I still have that heartbeat. My heart is to find the goal that other people don't realize they have, to see the good in others that we don't know is in there because the world slaps us with so many awful labels. And so I like to rip that old label off and say, no, you're, you are good. You do have good in you. You have purpose and help people find that purpose in giving back to others. And, and again, I think we're created that way. We do our best work when we're serving other people. Are humans created that way or are women created that way? <laughs> that is not a fair question. <laughs> um, I'm going to say humans are created that way. I am also going to say that my belief system says that God created women to be more nurturing. Um, and men to be more of the protector and provider role. And that's really dogmatic for a lot of people to hear that. Uh, and I'm okay with them saying that. Mm -hmm. um, what I believe is that women's heartbeat is for the family, that, that we have gotten so far away from what we were created to be as women, that that is hard for people to hear. Um, but that I do believe women are created to have that nurturing and that I want to take care of attitude. And so nonprofits being the, the market uh, business market part of our industry world, that we find a problem and we help solve that problem. We're able to say, you know, if, if that's a problem, why can't we fix it? Because we want to fix it and we want to make it better. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where some of that comes in. And then because of the movement of the world and in women in the marketplace, right? We're not staying at home all the time. Um, we have found our niche in the industry of the nonprofit world. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Jenny, let's uh, rewind with you and talk about kind of your life slash career path that led to literacy volunteers. What were you, how would you, if you had 30 seconds to define your world before literacy volunteers, what would you say? Yeah, um, I worked my first 14 years in manufacturing and quality assurance, but, and it was a local organization. And as my um, service through the company with United Way, um, I learned about literacy volunteers. This is kind of how it ties together for me. This has been over 20 years ago, but was able to connect several of our employees with literacy volunteers. And I learned about the desperate need for adult 
literacy education in our community and how it impacts individuals and their families. And then I worked my next 13 years at Virginia Tech um, in alumni relations. And so not for profit, but not exactly the same as the small nonprofit world. Um, and so my son graduated high school. I was ready then to give my time to literacy volunteers and signed up as a volunteer. And not too long after that, the executive director position came open and I was lucky enough to get this opportunity to kind of take what I learned in the alumni relations development world, fundraising world, and and apply it to a much smaller shop. Mm -hmm. I would imagine, I mean, given your experience in the manufacturing world, and especially with a, an organization like Virginia Tech and alumni relations, which is a very important and prestigious position, you could have gone into any number of fields, but you chose a small nonprofit. And I'm wondering more about why. <laughs> I did. Um, and that was what my boss asked me when I said I was leaving Virginia Tech, uh, because I was passionate about their cause there and felt very valued as a as a staff member there and enjoyed working with my team. Um, I felt like I have the advantage of being sort of in the last third phase of my career. Mm -hmm. And I just I had this opportunity to really take the skills that I've developed over the years and funnel it into a true passion project. So not that I'm not passionate about the Hokies. I am, I'm a Hokie. Um, but just to kind of, yeah, be able to to steer that into a place that was such a, a personal passion for me to begin with. Mm -hmm. So kind of similar to what I asked Carol, and, and I don't mean for this to be a leading question at all. You feel free to disagree. But I mean, is there anything about being a woman that led you to or maybe what we would call maybe stereotypical or typical female traits that led you to this passion project of a small nonprofit? Yeah, I think so. And I've thought about this quite a bit, um, just the, the issue of women in nonprofits, because we do, at least in our area, um, tend to have primarily um, women leadership and, and women who work in them. I do think um, I personally got this opportunity because my husband and I discussed it and it was a ch big shift for me salary wise kind of a, a shift to a, a whole different um bracket but it was a very conscious L L choice and something L that liter literacy volunteers doesn't pay as much as Virginia Tech <laughs> alumni relations <laughs> it does not it does not <laughs> Um, it was a big, a big change, but one that we made consciously and together yeah. and we're fortunate to be able to choose that at this time. We also get, um, I assume it's probably true with Carol's group. We don't have benefits, um, here as far as health insurance. And we do have a small, um, retirement benefit here at our organization that's new, but other than that, um, you know, we just don't kind of have those things to offer. So you do have to really have that passion and interest for what you're doing. And so specific to women and having those traits, um, I, I, I am a mother, but I only have one, which is a little bit on the opposite spectrum of Carol. And so um, I do have two um, recent stepchildren. And so, but they, they're older, so I didn't get to mother them in the same way um, as my son. But I, I guess you do have to have that sort of, um, caregiving, kind of wanting to care for others. And Carol alluded to this a little bit, but helping them break down the barriers to get to where they need. I think that's a very a sort of a mothering. You don't have to be a mother to do that, but that's kind of a mothering thing to do to, to let them do the work, but break down the barriers and give them the resources that they need to do that, if that makes sense. And I firmly believe that men have that too. My husband mm -hmm. is very caring and has those same um, qualities. I just think the way our society is structured, it's easier for women to to act that out, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, you know, I hear you talk about, you know, uh, pay cuts. And I wonder if the salary, the compensation is more important of a driver for men than women. I that I think so. I think that men are programmed by society the way that we are right now, but to really seek out uh, the salary and opportunities for growth. Um, also, I think women are are more 
tend to be like that too. And so in, in our leadership positions, I've noticed that we not only tend to be women, at least in our area, but also tend to be in a later part of our career than just starting out. Yeah. Um, because we, we have these life skills and we've seen things that sort of allow us to make that choice um, to choose with our hearts instead of our, our wallet. And again, I do, it's unfortunate you have to be in a financial position to be able to to do that and make ends meet. Um, if I was still a single mom, which I was for a while, I may not, well, I wouldn't have been able to make the same decision. At, at a minimum, I had to have the benefits, um, you know, to be able to care for myself and my son. And once again, I'm joined here on Buzz for Good by Carol Young, Executive Director of Healing Strides of Virginia, and Jenny Ayers, Executive Director of Literacy Volunteers of the New River Valley. And both are here on Buzz for Good talking about why women lead nonprofits or what makes women particularly suited to lead nonprofits. I'm going to pose this to both of y'all. You know, I, I hear that the mission of a nonprofit speaks to you as far as wanting to be part of the nonprofit uh, and, and that caregiver nurturing role. But the desire to be part of a nonprofit and the skill set to lead a nonprofit are two different things. And I'm wondering if in your observations, have you seen a uh, some traits, maybe more typically defined by women, that suit women to be better nonprofit leaders? That's a really I, interesting I question. <laughs> it is, it is. And I don't know that I would specifically attribute this to women, um, but women, uh, including Carol and I in this small sample here, I heard Carol um, saying that she has uh, a level of entrepreneurship in selling the, the log cabin and figuring out how to make that happen. She has um, learned for herself how to be a teacher and operate her own school with her family. And I think um, that's also been an interest of mine. I've had kind of just side creative related businesses over the years. And I love, I, I like in our really small shop here, part of what appealed to me is really being able to have that entrepreneurial mindset. We're not we answer to our board and we answer to our donors and, of course, our students um, and volunteers. But other than that, I get to make a decision um, if we're going to use this database and let's try this now. And um, and that's part of the job that really appealed to me from a leadership standpoint. Mm -hmm. And Jenny, I love that you said it that way. Um, I think that's where maybe men and women don't differ so much is that we have a desire um, for the leadership role because we feel that our life has prepared us in, for that. We do have the skill set to move that forward. The entrepreneurial mind is, especially in a nonprofit that's growing, that you're kind of coming in on the ground floor, is really important to be able to say, how can I make this work? You know, one of my veterans who I love because veterans have that uh, servant attitude, whether they're men or women too, they want to give back. But he says the thing that he loves about Heal Healing Strides is that we're a can-do. You know, we we will figure out how to make it happen and figure out how to make it work. But that's where that creativity and that that love of of service, servanthood, but also making things work for the good. You know, I, I love what that's kind of the, your tagline buzz for good. Right. What are we doing that's making things better? And that is an entrepreneurial mindset. And so whether that leadership skill comes from because you're a female or a male, I think that's where it may not be so different because I do work with other nonprofits and do some consulting and, and I work with a lot of men and that, that I don't see the difference in mm -hmm. you know, the, the men tend to punch a little harder and drive a little harder in that regard of pushing things. And I have to, when I'm working with them, say, you know what, maybe we need to slow down a little bit. Maybe we need mm -hmm. to take a breath right here. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's kind of a balance, I think, that that may be different in the, the man and the woman leader. Um, but I think the desire um, to lead well is strong in both men and women. Mm -hmm. I it. agree. And I think um, one thing that I had just read about nonprofit leadership in general is that it's about half women overall, but it's more men in the nonprofits that are at the million dollar budget right. levels there that, that create roadblocks for women to kind of 
uh, I would just say a uh, boys club kind of situation yeah. still happens very much at those larger organizations. And I wonder if, and again, I don't think men are born this way. I think it's just a, a reflection of what our society has expected from them. So the leadership in the very small shops might tend to be more women because we really do have to wear all these hats. I mean, you get to be the leader, but you're also answering the phone and making the copies and, um, you know, putting packets together and stuffing the envelopes. And so um, I don't know if that's because it's historically been seen as women's work that that may be less appealing um, well, I wonder if to men. I wonder if servant leadership is more. Hmm women oriented mm -hmm. whereas men feel as though maybe more of a need to be prestigious and therefore some work of a smaller nonprofit is beneath them and i put that in quotes <laughs> yeah I, I i think the servant heart is not necessarily male or female um i think we may be trying to distinguish some things that aren't really distinguishable in that regard because some of the nonprofits that I work with um, are small, right? Mm -hmm. But I do agree that like a, a stay-at-home mom, you're wearing a million hats. You're you're responsible for transportation. You're responsible for menus. You're responsible for budgeting. You're for all the, the management, the time management, getting schedules, which plays very nicely into a small nonprofit or even a larger nonprofit as you grow. You know, we started out when I started here, the budget was $10,000 a year. We're now at almost a million dollars a year, which blows my mind. One of my <laughs> employees pointed that out because I said, oh my gosh, we're just so busy. She's like, well, Carol, you are running a million dollar organization. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, I am, right? Because, because I was the one pulling the weeds out of the garden. I was the one pulling the weeds out of the arena and grooming the horses and cleaning the tack and all the things, right? And so having that growth process has been really interesting. I tell people I've painted myself into a corner office, right? Um, because I'd much rather be out there teaching a riding lesson. That's a whole lot more fun. Um, <laughs> but but that, that, I think, the skill of that has come with the job. Right. It wasn't that I walked into that job. It was that we developed that job. And is that equal to what a man would do? I would say probably yes. I think the difference in lies is, is, is that where we started from, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right. To wrap up, what would be a word of advice that each of you would have for a woman seeking to be? take on more of a leadership role in the nonprofit world and for men. Well, so from my perspective, still being, I kind of was in the very much for-profit to the higher ed, which is kind of a little bit in the middle. They're not for profit, but you know, much larger um, to, to our mission. I think, so I'm still fairly new in this role, but I, I think that we struggle with imposter syndrome. And so you think, okay, I, I believe I have the skills to do this. I think I have the skills to really make a lasting impact on this organization, but I haven't done it before. And we can learn about nonprofit leadership, but every nonprofit and their mission is different in the way that we run is different. And so I think to it's okay to have that, to feel like you're in that imposter role, but to really embrace it and be open to... Um, be open to learning new things and knowing that you can do it. And you can also uh, change the job to be the way that, um, that you think it needs to be. That'll take the organization to the next place. Lovely. Carol. Yeah, I, do. I love that. Um, so I, I would go a little bit different angle in, in saying that to piggyback on what she says, I think everything she said is exactly great advice. Um, but that next step has to be a balance. And I think that's where, um, women in particular get jammed up a little bit anytime they have a career path that they're seeking is where is that balance in my life being a wife being a mom being whatever the, the other part of your life is right uh, with this is a demanding 24 7 job when you're a ceo running an organization you're on call all the time and so how do you balance that and giving yourself grace I think that we don't, we're hard on ourselves. The imposter syndrome is exactly what a lot of people face, but being able to give ourselves the grace that we would give somebody else. 
you know, because it's really easy for us to say, oh, you should do that. But are we looking in the mirror and doing that for ourselves? Mm. And, and are we taking the time to say, you know what, you're where you are because that's what your purpose is. You're where you are because God has a plan for you. And then taking that and being able to say, you know what, this is, this is a beautiful thing. And, and whether I do it right or do it wrong, I can fix it. Right there, most of the things I have learned over time is that you think it's really important. It has to be done right now, and it really doesn't. <laughs> it really doesn't. If you sleep on it, if you take the time to say, you know what, we'll worry about that tomorrow. We're not going to worry about that today. That 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 ability to balance those things is really vital to long term leadership in any organization. Wow! Wow! That is wonderful advice. That's great. That's great. Well, uh, Jenny Ayers, Executive Director of Literacy Volunteers of the New River Valley, and Carol Young, Executive Director of Healing Strides of Virginia, thank you all so much for coming on to Buzz for Good and sharing your perspectives on why women lead nonprofits. Thanks so much. Thanks, Michael. Thank Jenny, you. It's a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> and you as well, <laughs> Carol. Thank you. <laughs> I know. That'd be great. <laughs> And it's great to welcome back to Buzz, Jody Judge, who's the Executive Director of Brain Injury Services of Southwest Virginia, which we were honored to present on a TV episode last year and the great work that they do throughout our region. Jody, welcome. Thanks, Michael. It's great to be back with you all. It feels a little bit like home. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're very sweet, very sweet. So. Uh, obviously, I want to talk about brain injury services and your work there uh, coming up. But I want to start, though, with what was your working family life like before you began the nonprofit world? Well, if I can remember that long ago, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I have been doing some type of human services work since uh, coming out of college, but mm. um, I did not get into the nonprofit uh, sector of human services work until I actually had uh, my oldest uh, son. And what kind of drove it was that, you know, I was uh, a new mother and I had this wonderful new uh, little addition to our family, but I was working a job um, with individuals with disabilities, but it was contracted through the state that basically I worked whenever they were scheduled to work. So I did not have a set schedule. And with a newborn at home, that just really wasn't conducive my life at the time. And that directed me to an agency um, that had a heart still for the population I was serving, but also um, saw the benefit of having, you know, a, a schedule that worked for individuals that were that were doing great work inside uh, the walls of their home as well. Hmm. When or what inspired you then to transition to nonprofits? So it was at that point in time that I actually ended up uh, where I currently am now at Brain Injury Services of Southwest Virginia. And what became apparent shifting gears at that point in time is that there, um, of course, was a great need for the population that we were serving, but we were very unique in the way we were able and we still are able to serve the population that we do, those that are survivors of acquired brain injury and their family. We were able to do that from a very person-centered perspective, which at the time wasn't quite the buzzword, no pun intended, <laughs> um, for human services uh, now. But so we were able to really tailor services um, in a way that met the needs of the individuals receiving our services versus um, in the way that maybe uh, a larger governing agency or mm. overseeing medical system was instructing us to do so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What was it within you that kind of made you feel that working in the nonprofit world was was home. 
there's always been some sort of internal uh, drive to be of service to others. Mm -hmm. I saw that uh, growing up. You know, my mother is one of the most generous individuals uh, that you would probably ever meet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, her philosophy um, in life has been we are just conduits. So what we are given, you know, isn't for us to hold on to or to hoard more or less. To, that is to throw through us, flow through us rather. So, you know, if we are able to give money, great. If we're able to give time or talent or treasure, then we need to be doing that because that's truly how um, we make a global difference. But on a, you know, it all starts at home and then our communities are just the extension of our home. And so really being someone in the community that are seeing the individuals that just need either, you know, assistance connecting to the correct resources or being the actual resource that they may need um, drives, you know, my, my desire to be of service and nonprofit, you've got to have that because we all know you you know we're nonprofit yeah. <laughs> you know need i say more you know you've got to have some type of internal motivation and that for me is to truly make a difference in the lives of people in our communities you're not the first person i've spoken with for this show who has mentioned the importance of their mother in shaping their hearts and souls to do this work uh, I find that interesting. And is there something uniquely female or feminine that also contributes to this work? I think that, you know, being a woman in in general is a unique gift that we are given. And I think that, um, you know, men have their own skills, talents, and attributes that just make this world a great place and women as well. I think what makes us unique is we do have this innate um, a thing within of a caregiving nature. Uh, we, we tend to be the caregivers and the caretakers. We tend to be very uh, relationship driven. So, mm. you know, doing what we're doing with human service work um, where is really connected at that level we are forming relationships with individuals we're building trust we're saying to them hey i see you 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 may feel unseen but i i see you and i, I do think that women um have a have a skill set um for those types of things the other thing that i i, I think is that you know we're used to um an enduring race. In other words, you know, we juggle a lot of things and we are the keeper together of things. And it doesn't matter if I'm sick. My kids still need to have dinner. I mean, that's just the bottom line. And it's the same in the professional world. You know, it doesn't matter if the if the funding um, isn't there. Our job is to find a creative solution, a workaround to get us to our end goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, that kind of, you've already kind of answered it, but, you know, I find that there's a difference between having a heart to work with nonprofits and or for nonprofits, and then a, a separate skill set to actually lead, successfully lead a nonprofit. Um, are there some leadership qualities that you have been able to rely on being a woman to help you further? I, I do think that what has been significant in my own path is that if you, if you take a look at the human services field, it is comprised primarily of women. Um, I, I love the fact that you um, were like, oh, of all the nonprofit leaders, the majority of them that I've met are, are women. And I, I think that speaks to, um, for me, I have come from a place of direct service. 
And so I have done the work that I am leading my team to currently do. So I have a very interesting perspective. Um, it's not a perspective of just from an administrative level. It is a perspective that I am seeing each member of my staff as a person, and I see that what they are doing inside and outside of work is what I'm doing. So I believe one of the one of the things that I do bring to the table is the ability to understand from a level because I've been there or I'm currently there. And then also um, understanding that, you know, there are difficult decisions that have to be made, absolutely. But it's like I tell my staff, we can talk about anything as long as we remain respectful. So if you have really poured into your staff and built, built those relationships, then you know, it's kind of easy to lead <laughs> yeah. a staff that is as phenomenal as, as, as mine is because it is very relational. And we have been very intentional over the last year and a half to two years about our workplace culture. And our employees aren't our greatest asset. We don't consider them assets. They're human beings. And we really do try to focus um, on them from that perspective and, and leading in such a way that it, I am responsible for the bottom line. I am responsible to our board and to our stakeholders. Um, however, when I am showing my staff, I care about you not only as a staff person, as an employee, but as a human being who has their own family and their own struggles and their own successes, I think that is what makes leadership successful beautifully said beautifully said once again here i'm joined on bus for good by jody judge who's the executive director of brain injury services of southwest virginia last question jody what advice would you give to either a man or a woman who's interested in becoming successful quote unquote in the nonprofit world well I, the first thing, definitely, and you know me at this point, I, I don't have the skill of being concise, so I'll probably give you a couple things. <laughs> um, number one, don't ask your staff to do something you would not be willing to do. Mm -hmm. um, a good example today is, you know, we had, they came by and did the landscaping at our office, and there was all this mulch just within our atrium. I was out there with a the broom cleaning it up. There isn't there isn't anything that is above or, uh, above or below. So don't ask your staff. The other thing is really take the time to get to know each of them. And it's real, that's important because communication is probably the number one thing that makes any organization work successfully or not. And what I had to learn a long time ago is how I communicate with one person isn't necessarily going to be successful to another. Learning how they receive information and learning how they need to be able to give information was one of the most important things. So communication in a various different ways, I think, is something that people need to know. And then specific to nonprofit work, just know you are going to have to love it and be passionate about the mission. We don't get into this work to make a million dollars or to become rich people <laughs> in a monetary sense. We become rich in other ways, and that's in the ways that we are making an impact and a difference in our community. Mm. Amen. Amen. Well, Jody Judge, Executive Director of Brain Injury Services of Southwest Virginia, thanks so much for the work you do for Brain Injury Services, which in turn just makes it a better, more fulfilling community that we all are able to live in. So thank you. It is my privilege. Once again, on today's Bus for Good, we are celebrating Women's History Month in March with a special episode 
highlighting why women lead nonprofits. And you're invited to check out all of our past radio shows, as well as our TV show, Buzz, by going to our website, buzzforgood.com. That's buzz, B-U-Z-Z, number four, good.com. Also stay connected with us throughout the week on our social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube, all at Buzz for Good. And again, we have a free community watch party for our next episode of Buzz that airs on March 29th at 7 p.m., starring The Least of These Ministry, and that watch party will take place at the Grandin Theater. More information on our website, buzzforgood.com, under events. And now, back to our show. All right, so Lisa O'Neill, Executive Director of Angels of Assisi, welcome to Buzz for Good. Thanks, thanks for having me. Yeah, so if we could, I want to rewind a little bit in time just so you can share with us kind of in 30 seconds or so, kind of what was your life like before entering the nonprofit world, whether, you know, family, work, that sort of thing? Um, I was actually a nurse in Chicago and I did um, liver, kidney and pancreas transplants. I didn't personally do them. I took care of the patients after they had them and I sure. loved it. And then I was a dialysis nurse, which was a totally different perspective. Um, one type of patient was a very short term patient and a very intense patient. Dialysis patients, that's a whole lifestyle. So I think during my time in dialysis, um, it was learning how to deal with people who were going through like a very chronic, stressful, debilitating illness. And mm -hmm. I learned an awful lot that way. Um, we were fortunate enough to make the move to Roanoke from Chicago and another aspect of life that was like day and night and we love it here so much. But I think um, being a nurse sort of transitioned and a lot of those experiences transitioned into the nonprofit world. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But well, what inspired you to even enter into the nonprofit world rather than staying as a nurse? I have a love for animals and um, somebody once, my best friend asked me, what makes you tick? And I have a love for helping people. Mm -hmm. So um, at Angels, I'm really fortunate to sort of combine those two things because our main goal is to keep pets in their families who love them very much. So yeah. um, they say, do what you love to do and you'll never work another day in your life. And that's how I feel. So I've got the animal portion of it, which I love very much. And then um, we get to help an awful lot of people here. So uh, every day is actually hard oftentimes, but it's always a good day. That's wonderful, wonderful. Well, I mean, what is it from your perspective about women? And I'm, I'm stereotyping, I realize, but what is it about you know women that leads them to wanting to be involved with nonprofits? So I thought about the nonprofits that I know that are run by women and different things that those women have in common. And what I keep coming back to is that they have a really strong ability to recognize emotional intelligence in mm -hmm. people. I mean, folks can be book smart all day long and know their numbers and run their numbers and do all of that. But you, I think, also have to have a feel for not only the people that you're serving, but your staff members have to have a certain element to be able to fulfill those missions. So like here at Angels, we can have somebody that can do all the books and everything, but that person also has to have a real sense of understanding of seeing the big picture. We may have folks that are super grouchy that come in and they want services for their pet. Well, they can be grouchy and you can write that off or you can kind of think of why. Why are they grouchy and why are these folks angry? And what we see over and over and over again is that they're worried about money. So they're worried they're not going to have enough money to take care of their pet. They're worried about what's going to happen to their pet if they can't be seen. Are they going to get sick? Are they going to die? Are they going to lose them? So I think the overriding factor in leadership with women in nonprofits is that ability to detect emotional intelligence, hmm. both in the people that they're serving, but also the people that are on staff and working to help and fulfill that mission. Mm, beautifully put, beautifully put. Uh, is that a, an innate trait of women or is it something that society has kind of inculcated? I feel like it might be a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of women that 
transition into leadership roles, they've had to have that with maybe their kids and their family and the balancing act. And, you know, when your kids are acting up or something, you got to kind of dig a little bit deeper and find out what's happening and why. And wearing a lot of different hats to solve those problems. So I think that women have a lot of that innately. And I think a lot of it is also learned. So I don't know the exact ratio, but I think it's a little bit of both, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, once again, I'm joined here on Buzz for, for Good by Lisa O'Neill, who's the executive director of Angels of Assisi. Um, if you had some advice to give to men or women in, who maybe are thinking about entering into this nonprofit space, either as just a, a volunteer, a staff member, or as a leader, what would you say to them? I think um, the two things that I've learned are to listen. And if things are hard or people are having a hard day or there's a big problem out there, oftentimes the people that are working with you, they'll have the ideas because they're living in that moment. They see what's happening and they may have some very good ideas, but might be afraid to say them. So I think communicating and listening to people and not listening to respond, but listening to understand what people are saying, take a step back, take a breath. Um, and just truly listen to what folks are saying, and you'll learn a lot. And I think that people sometimes when they talk things out, they will also learn a lot and come to some conclusions, and then everybody sort of works together. Um, and the second piece of advice I have, and we try very hard here at Angels, but it's not always possible, but is to give people the tools and resources that they need. Because if they don't have certain, th I mean, it could be as simple as, you know, proper enough pens to use when you're trying to do a busy job to computers, to um, access to information that will help them do a job better. I think if you give people the tools that they need to do the job right time and time and time again, those folks are going to come back and have brilliant ideas and they're going to collaborate and they're not going to have that frustration of trying to get what they don't have, that will free them up to use those creative energies and to come up with some really great solutions and great ideas to help everything go forward. Beautifully put, beautifully put. Well, thank you for all the work that you do for Angels of CC, which in turn, you know, helps our community. And, uh, and I applaud you and I applaud all women who are in this space for caring about our community and wanting to give their lives to making it better. I applaud them as well. Yes, absolutely. It it's a community for sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm delighted to welcome back to Buzz for Good, my good friend, Melissa Woodson, who is executive director of Ramp House, Roanoke Area Ministries. Hey, Melissa. Hey. <laughs> so today's show, talking about women in leadership roles for nonprofits and you I've just always been so impressed with, especially, you know, our time producing an episode on Ramp House way back in 2020. And, but before we kind of talk about your role with Ramp House, you were fairly new to Ramp House at that time, but what was your life like before then, as far as career, family, what, how would you define your, your life before Ramp House? I was raised in a lower middle-class atmosphere and, you know, I've done a lot of things in my life, but there's nothing more that excites me than bringing people who are from uh, a more uh, vulnerable background into realizing who they can become. Mm. I mean, when I was a little girl and growing up in a semi-rural area with parents who had um, struggles, but oh, they did well, they were hard workers. But I never thought that I would be somebody that would be in leadership or go to college even, you know? So the fact that I, I overcame that background where people thought they couldn't do something and I did it, that's always been something that I've wanted to do for other people to make them re realize who they are. All those little girls out there that think that they're not worthy or enough or they're not good enough. I just love being in a position to tell them they are. I love it. I love it. Well, you know, to me, and I'm wondering if, if you would agree with this or disagree with it, but in hearing you say that, you know, that, that grit to overcome, mm -hmm. you know, uh, adversity is something I think all people share, but mm -hmm. then you go a step further, then wanting to help others do the same. 
I'm wondering if that's more of a trait that's characteristic of women. The nurturers, absolutely, are mothers. I mean, I think about my mom. Mm -hmm. My mother was a housewife. My mother was bright. She was a really smart lady, but she never had the economic power to do what I could do. And I'll tell you something, the day that the library was built and opened in King George County, my mother had me as a five-year-old in the first reading groups. I don't remember a time where I wasn't going to college. That was mm. just, and I was a first generation college student. And I think I look back on it, my mother, her, her talent and her wonder and what she always wanted to do was be a great wife and mother. She wanted me to have more and she, God bless her, she pushed that, she pushed that. And she was like the primary force behind me that said, you're no different than anybody else and you're smart and you can do this. Cause I'm not really sure that I internally had that, but if it hadn't been for her and it hadn't been for that push. And I know as women, we want to do better. We want, you know, we, this isn't right. That isn't right. But I am so satisfied with where my mother's generation lifted me. Mm. And I think that that is a beautiful legacy to carry on for other women. My nieces, you know, uh, mentors, Emily, your daughter, mm -hmm. I adore her. You know, just all the me young too. people out there. And there is such, there's such, there's more than they can do than I did. And just the opportunity to get them to believe in themselves. Mm -hmm. It's very important to me. That's beautiful. Well, thank you on behalf of, you know, my daughter who was an intern with you back in oh, 2021 and she just relished the experience and relished learning leadership from you. Yeah, uh, I think she, and I think the one thing that Emily, Emily and I are both Mary Washington college girls or Mary, a university of Mary Washington. That's right. But I think the thing that Emily got from Bram house is the servant leadership aspect. Mm -hmm. Um, not for a minute do I walk in this building and think I'm going to go sit at my office and politely type away. You know, I'll be down there washing a dish in a heartbeat because that's how this is. This is this mm -hmm. is the climate that we're in with what we do. And um, the, I think Emily really caught on to that. And, and yeah. she was so good about going where doing whatever we needed of her, you know, but that's this business. And that's what I love. Yeah. Yeah. Um what inspired you to even enter into the nonprofit world? It's really kind of interesting. I'm, I, by trade, am a uh, biology major. Mm. And I always thought I wanted to help people who were sick and I was going to be a physical therapist. And then I worked as a phlebotomist in college to pay the rent. And I didn't like seeing people sick. So I learned mm. that very early on. <laughs> And then I went to work at a naval base and I hated it. I just, I just knew this wasn't the right thing for me. So I ended up getting a job for Red Cross Blood Services and I loved it. And my favorite job of all to date was working at Boys Home in Covington as a team leader. You know, um, I love having uh, the impact to do those kind of jobs where you're where you're you're showing people another way. And of course, learning from them, too. Don't get me wrong. I mean, mm -hmm. I'd say the boys at Boys Home made me who I am today as a woman. <laughs> they they were so honest and they 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 you really had to battle with yourself and your own demons to become a better person. Hmm. So I had a lot of the pieces, but I wasn't real sure about the business aspects of it. So in 2004, I entered Averett U University to get an MBA because I wanted to know how to run a non profit as mm -hmm. a business. Mm. And I was the oldest person in the class at the time. And then from there, I just seemed like the positions came, you know, gotcha. They, gotcha. they came and the leadership came. And I remember thinking to myself, you leading a company, are you kidding me? But it's just as natural to me now as anything riding a bike, you know, it's just yeah. right, what I do and love. Well, you know, you got your MBA, which could have taken you into the for-profit direction. Mm -hmm. But obviously, I, there was something within you that made you want to give back, serve others. My yeah. parents. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like, it's, that's what I grew up with. Like, my father was one of these people who he may not had anything. And if somebody needed something, he would take his wallet out and hand it to him, not even knowing who they were. 
Um, I tell people often so much so that my mother had to say, stop, we've got children to feed, you know, (laughs) but that's how they were. And my mother was the type of woman that she helped all the people, older people in the neighborhood die. You know, I mean, that they, they were just the most wonderful salt of the earth people. I, I don't get joy. I never got the joy out of the idea of doing something that, that wasn't for lifting other people. And it's through my parents 100%. And as I mentioned before, my mother had a great deal of influence over that. Mm, Nice. Nice. Oh yeah. She was terrific. (laughs) Well, what are some, from your perspective, like perhaps uniquely uh, unique traits that women have that make them good nonprofit leaders? And we've talked about, um, you know, a, a, a desire for nurturing that have kind of brings them to the space, but are there, are there other like leadership skills that perhaps are more u- unique to women in today's world? It's really interesting because you look at the style of men versus the style of women quite often. And I mean, it depends on the person, of course, yeah. but by and large, I think, I think that women tend to be of a more gentle nature with men a lot of times you know you know how guys are they can tease each other and it isn't a big deal but women we're so sensitive towards each other so i think that there's a very nurturing quality for women who who come into leadership positions because they're so cognizant of of how other people feel or how other people take things and um you know i mean it's a mix it's mm-hmm. a mix you i think men add to that but I think it takes both styles to make things run. And again, I think one of the reasons that a lot of us women turn towards the nonprofit field, especially if you're talking about homelessness or just these, these uh, human, addictions. human services. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Human services and social services. It's, it's just such a natural conduit for us to fall into. Mm. Mm. Because big hearts, you know, yeah. just the, the whole yeah. thing where we're, where we, where we feel responsible for those around us. And I think mm-hmm. it's probably a lot to do with how we're cultured. Yeah. Even yeah. as, you know, becoming mothers and all, all of that, mm-hmm. aunts, mm-hmm. mothers, grandmothers, we all, um, we all serve as the matriarchs, the proverbial matriarchs. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. I love it. I love it. What advice would you have for a woman who, or man, who's interested in getting involved in the nonprofit world? I would say this, and this is the single most important thing that I have found in leadership that has led me to success. And that is when you give the credit out to other people and you lift them up rather than wanting yourself to be looked at, the light naturally shines back on you Mm. and your organization becomes successful. The other thing I would say is, and we have a very small staff that does a lot. I can't believe it sometimes. All we do, feeding 200 people a day, serving 75 people in that day shelter, you know, the, the 24 people that we process a week to keep from becoming homeless in the first place with a very limited number of people. There is nothing that I would ask of my staff that I will not go down there and do with them. hmm and mm-hmm. that makes a difference. Yeah. I think when you come specifically into the human services field, you better come humble and you better come willing to not to do anything you would ask anyone else to do because it is not easy and it's not always a clean job. And you know, there's there's days that I left leave here where I've done both administrative and program stuff. But that's what it takes to do what we do. And by the fact, if you're a leader and you're going to do it yourself, there's nothing that other people won't do as well. And I think that's what makes things successful here at Ram House. A-plus staff. Melissa Woodson, Executive Director of Ram House, Roanoke Area Ministries. Thanks so much for coming back on Buzz for Good. And it's always great to see you, my friend. Thank you for everything you do. I've been watching you. 
And it's so fun to learn everything going on and just the uplift that you give people as well.